From the University of Tromsø, we have Associate Professor and Head of the War Game Research Project, Olga Puch. And uh, we have associate, uh, assistant professor and games researcher Christine Ask. <laughs> and we have scoop winner, veteran, and gamer Christopher Egebach. <laughs> and now we're going to the other end of the spectrum war as entertainment. Which brings us directly to you, Christopher. Um, I, I think maybe we should start off just briefly uh, telling the audience, uh, you've been a soldier. Um, can you tell us just a bit about uh, what operations you've been involved in? Well, I'm, uh, I've been a soldier, um, a UN soldier in Lebanon um, uh, for a while. I'll, I've also been a, an officer in uh, Bosnia, and I know Sarajevo very well and in Kosovo, uh, in those conflicts. Um, so, and I started out as an infantry soldier in, uh, in the army. And you've also uh, seen war up close as a journalist. Yeah, and I've always been, uh, also been a journalist uh, in, in conflict zones uh, in the Middle East and, um, and uh, also in Kosovo. So, and uh, a lot of major uh, disasters, like the tsunami, etc. And you are an avid gamer. Um, what kind of games do you play? Well, I play a lot of war games. Uh, <laughs> I can pretty much list all of them, uh, but in this context I would point out like... Um, what I experienced kind of shifted the war game uh, uh, genre? 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 Yeah was uh, Operation Flashpoint, it's a couple of years ago now, but uh, that made war games uh, a lot more realistic. Uh, suddenly you ac actually have to crawl across a, a field for four hours to survive uh, the oncoming Russian or uh, soldiers. It's very uh, fun. <laughs> not very fun at all, uh, after four hours being, you know, actually driven over by an a, a armed personnel carrier. And you have to start all over because you didn't have any save points. Uh, so, um, so that was kind of a, a new experience. And uh, what I enjoy with, with modern war games uh, is that now, before, obviously, uh, they forced you to make um, decisions. I mean, tactical decisions uh, to... to um, the, the, the involvement of the games made made the tactical uh, decisions uh, more um, fulfilling. Uh, you had more choices. Uh, you could you know choose where to, to be a sniper. To, to uh, you, you had better sights. You could you know the graphics made it possible to to hide better or to to have a more realistic experience. But now also you have games which forces you to take moral choices, like in your game. Uh, which is quite new and, and uh, quite exciting, I think. And uh, your game, which I've only played now a couple of days, <laughs> is totally new because it, it, it forced you to take um, choices as a civilian and as a, being a victim of war, uh, which is quite absent in the traditionally uh, war games, which I've been playing uh, up until now, where you're basically you're either the hero or the villain, uh, and you're you, you know you just fight. Uh, but here you actually see the fallout of war, uh, and I can really really recognize Sarajevo in your uh, game. And uh, I was lucky I was not there at the actual siege. Uh, but a lot of my friends from Sarajevo, local uh, Bosnian friends, uh, and their stories uh, are very like uh, what I've experienced in, in this game. So, um, for instance, you've been on patrol in Lebanon. Yeah. Patrolling the, the blue line. The blue uh, line, yeah. Which is 
the Blue Line, well, in Lebanon, you had Unifil had sectors uh, within the kind of the, the war zone in uh, in South Lebanon, where the Israeli uh, and as Israeli supported the militias occupied this part of Lebanon, and you had uh, Hezbollah, Amal, and different other militias um, going at it. Uh, in pretty much a, 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 what you could call a modern conflict war zone with everything from from main battle tanks, uh, artillery, small units, patrols, uh, strikes, uh, all over the place, and and you had this UN mission more or less in between trying to observe and keep these parties from uh, making war, which is quite challenging. <laughs> so. Um Similarities and differences between that experience in games and uh, in reality. Um, well, as I said, uh, with modern war games, uh, you have um, with better graphics, with better sound, with better better movability, with seamless kind of uh, theater where you can walk all over where you have, you know, the equipment, the night goggles, everything uh, gives you kind of this, uh, I mean, I could really relate to, to these games and to my own experience as a, uh, as a, as a patrol uh, leader uh, and even uh, as the games has evolved, you have even the same sounds I could actually, uh, with a really good game, you could actually hear the, the difference of an AK-47 or uh, M16 gun, or uh, is that a, a mortar, or, or or an artillery shell uh, hitting the ground? Uh, all these things you can actually uh, find similarities to a modern and, and a very good game, uh, like you know Call of Duty, the latest Call of Duty games. Uh, you can relate to uh, how how the recoil <laughs> works, uh, how the sights works. Uh, you can recognize how to spot enemies uh, in in the in the theater, which is you know for skill uh, and much more skilled soldiers. We would actually would recognize uh, the tactics involved in war, and that's why uh, modern armies also use these kinds of war games uh, today to train soldiers, but. When it comes to reality, I think there's a very strict line because uh, you can always save, well, not in Operation Flashpoint, which is quite bad, uh, but you can always shut up. I mean, you don't have the pain. You don't have the actual uh, fear of dying, which uh, is the quite distinct thing that always will make a game a game, which is quite good because I don't think many people will, would play it if you actually <laughs> risk dying. And, and in your game, it was so nice last night to just, you know, I can't take this anymore and just shut the screen off and I had, you know, wood on the fire because these guys were so cold, they were dying <laughs> of frostbites, you know, but I had the fire in, in the stove, I had food. I, I got so hungry playing this game. <laughs> and, uh, and, and this is, you know, when, when a game can give you these emotions, I mean, you can really relate to it, um, uh, which in, in a traditional war game where you're just a soldier, you, you're doing this for getting the medals or getting, you know, to the next level, um, mixing in these kinds of emotion in these games is so interesting, and I think uh, makes gaming even, you know, it brings it to a next level. But, um, I mean, you've, you've seen um, some really horrible things uh, during your time. Um, why are you drawn, still drawn to these games uh, in spite of that? I think for the reason that everybody else is drawn to a game because it's a game, uh, and that's very important. I mean, it's a, it is a game, and and uh, I think absolutely most people uh, have no real problem in you know uh, seeing the difference, uh, and I mean, even the people who's experienced. I mean, even people in Sarajevo is playing your game, 
which is quite, you know, uh, strange. <laughs> but but still, it tells you that it is still a game, and that's a, that's a good thing. I mean, we we still. I mean, people, soldiers, they watch war movies, soldiers, they, they play uh, war games. Uh, it's blowing off steam, it's uh, entertainment, it's taking your mind off uh, real life for, for a moment. And, and it still is, uh, in spite of experience or seeing similarities in, in, a, in a game. So we have with us someone who is now doing an ex leading an extensive research project on war games. Um, Olga, can you uh, tell us a bit about war game? <coughs> well, it's a uh... yes. Hi, um, war game is an international research project that um, looks at the interrelation between war and games. And um, as a point of departure, we were kind of discontent with how games research very often was done, because you have the, the empirical section who say, oh, it's all about studying player cultures, and you have the psychologists, oh, it's all about individual psyches, and then you have the humanists, or, um, humanities people who say, well, it's all about game design and aesthetics. And uh, we thought instead of going into the usual um, academic trench warfare, we try to bring those together and see how each perspective can, in a way, um, benefit the other. And also look at, do the findings of each section actually correlate, or are there differences? If there are differences, why? And so on. So that was the point of departure, really. And uh, so, so in your, uh, in your project, um, can, you, can you give us like a short overview how is war portrayed in video games today? Well, I did a study on, um, I'm part of the humanities section, you can say, so I'm interested in the aesthetics of games and the game design and, um, and what these features invite players and spectators to do and to see. So I'm not saying that the textual structures determine us in any way, but they invite us to do something. They establish a frame within which we have to act, right? And what I found was, for example, you were speaking about realism in, in uh, Operation Flashpoint. And I think, yeah, it's realistic if you have to crawl four hours. But it's uh, still a selective form of realism. I mean, it always selects away things. And what the AAA titles, war-related AAA titles, usually select away are, for instance, civilians, are, for instance, collateral damage, are, for instance, long-term consequences, both psychological and societal, um, connected to warfare. So what, what they produce consistently is a sanitized version of warfare, um, which presents war as a thing between soldiers, and not only between soldiers, but also between soldiers which have equal skills and equipment. It's a form of symmetrical warfare. And, um, yeah. So, uh, Christina, you research players, uh, or the player side of video games. Um, how do, you, how do players relate and talk about these games today? Well, um, I think that uh, sort of the scene that is set by the games themselves kind of uh, have a huge effect on how players talk about them. When someone's playing you know, Call of Duty or Middle of Honor or any of those games, they don't go around talking about the conflicts and how they worry about the internal politics of Afghanistan. You know, it's everyone getting a chance to vote. Um, because they do this, this fantasy of uh, where conflict is always violent and leads to uh, leads to victory and getting the lady, uh, in, which is a trope of pretty much all popular culture. So that is still how gamers talk about it. Um, but what I found interesting is that when uh, when we try to bring in another dimension, there is a huge pushback. Um, Maren, who is uh, one of Skelpikin as well, who works with us. She did a review of the reviewers of Medal of Honor. So she looked at what different reviewers were writing when they were reading the game. And so, uh, when, um, and, and some people, some of the reviewers were bringing in, well, this is, oh, sorry, the Medal of Honor is in, in Afghanistan. And uh, some of the reviewers commented, well, this is a, you know ongoing conflict. Maybe we should be more careful about these people are portrayed. While other the reviewers are very clear that well, this is just another war, why shouldn't we be able to play and have fun here? And this, uh, this, this very strong divide 
that we found in the reviewers, but some felt it would be very strange to talk about this game without any kind of social, or political, or cultural background. Uh, whether other feel that it needs to be removed. I think that very well mirrors how a lot of gamers feel about discourses and discussions about war and games. That one of the appeals in these war games is that they are primarily escapism. They are a fantasy of, of power. It is about enjoyment. Um, so to, when we then want to talk about them in a more serious way, when we want to say, well, maybe this is shaping how we see the war. Maybe this is a terrible way to portray a conflict. Then we are reducing the ability for these games to be a free space where things that bother us in our real life, like for example being worried about how people are being treated in war, that is a consideration that uh, we have to bring into games. That sort of it really ruins the fun. Put it, put it simply, don't need an academic speaker. It ruins the fun. And I think that is uh, that is a real tension that is here. How to how to keep some kind of uh, fantastical or fantasy escapism while grounding it in atrocities of reality. There's an inherent conflict, and I would say there are very few game, games and designers, so you know, applause to you for this, but very few are able to make any kind of balance between these two underlying rationales, because they are inherently oppositional and in conflict. So, um, Holger, um, your research is among other things about, I mean, if we look at the effect of these games on players, I mean, the, the, the kind of traditional uh, worry is this kind of, you're going to get violent from playing violent games. And uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a lot of research to support that, but uh, what kind of effects do you see uh, stemming from these games? Um, well, I'm personally not into um, assessing effects, but of course a project partner, for instance, at the University of Amsterdam is uh, Tilo Atma. Um, First of all, um, regarding, I, I don't really like the term effects um, because it always suggests some kind of a linear model where you have a game that influences something that has a direct causal relationship to players or societies. This is not how it works at all. Um, what we are talking about are discourses, a complex system where we as subjectivities are placed within. And if you are constantly exposed by popular cultural expressions with a certain way of presenting, let's say, war, um, the whole, the entire system is um, kind of recalibrated and moved into a certain direction. This does not take um, the freedom away from those subjectivities within the discourse, but it um, opens a new area of possibilities and closes out some of those. So those are the kind of indirect, kind of cybernetic um, relationships between popular cultural expression, among them games, and uh, societies and cultures. Um, now, what <coughs> Thilo Hartmann found, he is, an, he is a media psychologist. That means he looks, he works with individual brains, as you mentioned. And um, he found that playing, uh, that um, when you kill characters in games without a proper reason, it produces at one level within the system a form of guilt, and thereby takes away the pleasures from games. So he found all that, but then he had no idea what to do with it before he looked at the humanity side of it because we could then show him how the aesthetics of game tries to take away that form of guilt by introducing what we call moral disengagement factors. So you do something within the game that makes all the characters you kill appear killable. They become ungrievable life, to use the term of Judith Butler. They are constructed as the great enemies, and the narrative then leaves you no other options but to eradicate them. And since this then becomes kind of a consistent theme and frame for the entire genre of war games, which are one of the most powerful cultural expressions we have nowadays, I think that they have a certain discursive impact on how we perceive war, the other possible solutions to conflict. And I don't want to take away the fun of playing war games. I just want to raise an awareness in the back of our heads that maybe we get something in the backpack by doing this, which we might not be aware of, and which we might not be particularly fond of as well. So, uh, Christina, you had a... Yeah, uh, I just uh, want to continue on this, Jan, because uh, it is true that we've been discussing war and games for a long time, and it has a long history and everything, chess and go, but always, always been connections. But in terms of digital games, video games, computer games, what do you want to call it, 
Um, I feel that, that uh, our gaming culture is part of the problem here because game culture has been, you know, been given the blame for pretty much anything bad in the last 20 odd years. The decay of moral youth today, oh, they're so terrible and they become violent and addicted and it's all problematic. So all, all, this, um, all this blame that has been wrongfully put on the sh uh, shoulders of gamers have led uh, game culture to become very defensive. Any time that we want to try to bring up that maybe it's not okay that in every game uh, we mostly shoot people that aren't white in their face, you know, that, uh, you know, how we treat children, how we treat maybe sexualized violence, how we, that maybe there's a problem when the military entertainment complex has such strong roots into this industry. Maybe there are some problems. Too many gamers revert to a sort of a, uh, the, um, Reverse today, well, you know, these are just game, let them be. We won't become violent. As if this entire discussion about war and games is about a concern for the individual player. And actually now, I, whereas 10 years ago, I would say that, is, that there was the public discourse lagging behind, it was the research lagging behind gamers, not taking gamers' experience seriously. But right now, I feel if anything, it's a gamers lagging behind. Is that the gamers are refusing to see that the rest of us are getting on with yeah, you're not becoming violent, zombie killing, you know, idiots. You are, you're not, you're not in danger. But maybe there is something. And then the gamers are the ones that are removing our ability to talk about games in a more serious way because they are so incredibly defensive. Why, why are they defensive? You think? I think that has to do with well, one with it's always wrongly put blame and how many, how many gamers have had fights with their parents or their partners or their teachers how many times games have been blamed for all their problems in their life, so they have a, a strong lived life where their enjoyment of games have been made into something bad, something they have to defend. So that's a very sort of instinctual part of being a gamer after a while. But more important, I think that um, you know, playing is hard work. You know, playing is really hard work. It takes lots of effort and knowledge and learning how to play the game and then making friends or allies and keeping that group together and turning up. It's really lots of effort uh, and we want to be very much in control of that effort in the end. We don't want anyone then to take away and say that maybe all these hours you played, maybe you be there, you know, maybe you got a bit more racist or maybe you got a bit more sexist. Or maybe your you know, view of reality got a bit skewed in a more simplistic or reductionist way. No, no, no. The, the, this, this need to fight for the value of games is so entrenched. And I think that is truly fueled by how hard work it is to play. So, uh, Holger, you were briefly talking about these um, moral disengagement factors that games. I, I wonder if maybe you should have, you should just share the mic because. I think there's, that has kind of a weird sound. Um, uh, so, these, um, uh, earlier on the phone with me, you, you mentioned like these four filters that games have to kind of show you that it's okay to kill. Yeah, um, moral disengagement factors, what enables you uh, morally to kill other characters. Uh, Partly the violence filter, that only one form of violence is really presented, the violence between soldiers. You have a character filter, which excludes women, um, children, and uh, non-military males. Um, usually only uh, soldiers are portrayed. You have a consequence filter, um, taking out long-term negative societal, economic, cultural consequences, but also um, socio-psychological uh, con um, consequences for both soldiers and civilians. Um, and you have a conflict filter. A conflict is always uh, Violent and can only be resolved through violence. Um, so this is this are the, these are the tropes of the genre, you can say. But I would like to add um, just something on gamer culture because what you said was really interesting. I think. Um, however, I think the discursive impacts I was talking about. I mean, we can't reduce this to gamer culture. It's really not only about gamers. It's about having huge billboards with a special force of soldiers crossed his guns, the Call of Duty stuff, when it came out in 2011. Filling out the inner cities of all major European and US cities, right, and Asian ones. So this kind of um, discursive articulation of soldiering as something powerful, heroic, um, uh, uh, positive, is, goes far beyond gamer culture. On the contrary, I think, in relation to this, gamer culture very often subverts this. Um, by, for, for instance, not really caring about where and what and just trying to win the games for people out the rules and stuff like that. Um, 
and then of course you have also the kind of counterculture in, in, in gamer culture, which provide a very important basis for independent productions, which um, like this War of Mine or like Spec Ops: The Line, which is a very powerful game, I think. Um, uh, uh, yeah, uh, kind of um, subverts and challenges this kind of established hegemonic military masculine discu discourse. So, uh, do, do we feel? I mean, war is entertainment. Is it? Is it a um, kind of a basic question? But is there a is there a big problem connected to it, or is it mostly a fine thing? And I, I think we can, we can all apply to that one. Start with you, Chris. Stop that. Hmm. Uh, obviously, I think I have mixed feelings. I think um, if 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 we should view it as a problem, I think the problem would be uh, to balance or the challenge is to balance uh, a game or war games or the stories in the war games with reality. Um, obviously, when I when I grew up, when I was young, my my first computer game was I think like Space Invaders or something like that. It was like pretty easy to to um, to differ that from reality and uh, and I think most educated people they have a lot of knowledge or some knowledge about the Second World War. That's why Second World War games are so popular. I mean you have the Nazis, they are very tabloid, they are, you know, down to the details of the uniforms, they are the bad guys. When I played the um, Medal of Honor, the, the traditional, the first series, I, um, you know, I, I love killing Nazis. Uh, when I played Battlefield uh, 1943, I never cho chose to be the Germans or the Japanese. I always was the Allied. I made a moral choice, um, which is quite fun in a game when you actually are challenged. I mean, I don't think many people think about this, but I think everybody has their favorites in, in their games, and that's choices you do, and, and increasingly it's moral choices you you do based on the knowledge you have from real life. Um, and that's, you know, back to, to the question, that's where I think it's challenging, is that um, maybe young people today, uh, and people who's grown up today in in, in very time-consuming entertainment uh, environment where news and reality is pushed more and more in the background. I think uh, we can see that. that I, I mean, I'm a journalist. I know that the reading rates are going down on even on the online news sites. Uh, less and less people are going to the front pages of Dagbladet, uh, Vega, of the uh, They only get their news from Facebook. Which is what is posted on Facebook, which what, which is what the uh, Facebook wants you to see and, and, and things you're interested in, etc. So I think reality is getting more blurred, and that's when you might get a problem uh, with uh, stronger and stronger visual and uh, games uh, giving you uh, choices, uh, mor moral choices, which you. I uh, do not really have the background, the education to, to you know, know how to choose right from wrong. Uh, and, and as I said, I have experienced uh, war zones and, and uh, um, catastrophes for real life. So I know the smell of, you know, gunpowder or, or death or etc. And that's why I have, a, I think, a strong moral compass or anchor which knows you know this is just a game uh, this does not give me the same impact that maybe uh, my 12 or 11 year old nephew would have playing the same games without the knowledge I have. What is it? Um, <clears throat> we have to remember that uh, one of them um, big uh, uh, reasons why people play games, and I don't mean just computer games, but games at all, uh, uh, even uh, kids uh, in the playground, uh, is that the games uh, let us uh, pretend to do things that are unthinkable. 
uh, so kids can pretend that they are shooting each other. And uh, well, there is usually not a big problem with finding kids to play the bad guys. Uh, and the same uh, applies to computer games. And I don't think that uh, uh, people who play, for example, uh, World of Tanks and who drive the uh, German uh, tanks from the Second World War, they don't uh, make any moral choice. This is just a cool machine. And it has a. It, it looks nice and has uh, uh, interesting parameters. And I don't think they give a second thought to the fact that those machines were, were used in perpetrating the uh, uh, worst atrocities of the Second World War. Uh, it, it gets detached. Uh, and uh, as you. You asked if if a war should be, can be entertainment. It, it is, it is. Uh, it, it, it's a very sanitized version. When we made uh, a game that uh, tries to present the war uh, in a much less sanitized version, uh, there is a lot of people who wouldn't call it entertainment. Uh, perhaps, uh, well, not all uh, films or not, not all movies uh, fell into that uh, category. Uh, they make us uh, uh, feel uh, the emotions that uh, wouldn't be accessible. Otherwise, they transport us, they let us imagine ourselves in different times, in different lives, and uh, I don't uh, see the reason why games uh, wouldn't uh, be able to do so. So, it is, uh, as I said, uh, I think games grew up, and uh, there is a lot of uh, empty space to fill in the field. And, uh, uh, and returning to your uh, question, uh, of course, uh, war, uh, the conflict, the fight uh, is uh, can be entertaining if you strip it of its uh, uh, bad side. If, when, if even when you crawl to the field in, in uh, mm, uh, Operation Flashpoint for four hours, you don't get to uh, feel all the bad things that go, uh, come with it. You don't, uh, you, you don't get bitten by the mosquitoes, you don't get uh, wet, you are not cold. So even, even those games that present war in a more realistic way, uh, the, the fight, uh, they, they are not actually all that realistic. Uh, so that's my take. <laughs> Okay, um, I just want to start uh, uh, to answer that question on you, um, or to talk about kids, because you the idea that uh, so the, the young generation are more, <laughs> oh, we have to be worried for them. Uh, I have to say that uh, when I was a kid, my mom would not let me watch uh, Turtles or Power Rangers, because she was afraid I would get violent. And a huge motivation for me to study media and uh, users has been to prove her wrong. Uh, however, as I get older, I am finding that I get more concerned about uh, sort of what do I actually surround myself with. Because it's, it's, as you were pointing out, it's not actually about the individual game or the fact that many games are theming war. Uh, it is the fact that uh, it is a hard, I have a hard time finding any sort of mainstream entertainment that doesn't use violence uh, or, or you know, conflict through violence as a way of progress, progress through plot. Pro, uh, as a way of mechanism in games. So, when talking about you know, should we have games that, that theme about war, my concern is more about, of, co of course we should, but we should maybe be more concerned about who is making these. I mean, there is still a very small subset of people on this planet making games. And they are mostly white, they are mostly men, and they are mostly in their mid-twenties. Maybe these are not the most, you know, maybe they do, do not represent the full diversity of the human experience. <laughs> Maybe their perception about what is power, what is enjoyment, is not the only one. Maybe there are many more ways of dealing with conflicts or war or, 
or even to have fun in, in these kind of in these tropes that just haven't been discovered. Um, another factor, besides the sort of this homogeneous uh, designer club, is again who who is funding this. Uh, I am being increasingly concerned about where the money for games are coming from. I mean, the, when you see so-called realistic games, uh, that means that someone has gotten money to show those specific weapons at a specific time with specific limitations about how they could be shown. And this is then where my sort of, who are actually making these games? It is not just those, the, the dudes in Silicon Valley, there are also other forces there. Uh, what has been labeled the military entertainment complex, which is the closest I will ever be to sounding like a conspiracy theorist. <laughs> uh, but the, these are, these, this, is a, this is a powerful drive in the entertainment industry. They have a huge budget, they have, and they have a very clear agenda. And that agenda is not to make sure that we have a, uh, a great gaming experience. Their agenda is to make war seem like a necessity, like something that is good for mankind, that's something that's even fun, and a way to improve yourself as a human being, as a nation. And those messages kind of get lost. Uh, the, the big messages kind of get lost when we discuss the individual games and if they are good or bad for you, uh, and well, how you maybe feel just after. It's about the, it's the ecology of war in the media that I'm concerned about. Very nice. <coughs> Thank you. I wasn't allowed to read Donald Duck because it would destroy my language, as it was said. Um, if if you, you point out the military entertainment complex and say that you might sound like a conspiracy theorist, I, I don't know what, what, what that would make me. Um, because I think really that's kind of a mainstream established fact today. And everyone, I just urge you, go to the DOD website, Department of Defense, and look into their cultural sections. There they detail exactly um, what you have to do if you want money or equipment or troops for a film or for a game or for whatever. And they take in your manuscript and they make the changes they want and they even specify what kind of changes this will be. We will make a film that provides a positive image of the US military and their benevolent role in global conflicts. Um, it's as easy as that. And, and there's no conspiracy theory because everything is open. Um, there's no subliminal form of um, yeah, seduction. Um, but they have a tremendous impact of what is presented, how it's presented, how it is framed, and this again has a decisive impact on the discourse regarding our wars, which we are waging, which such an ease. Just let's go bomb Libya, no problem. Um, we only hit the bad guys anyway. But I would like now to move on the discussion from the impact of bad games um, to what games can do. And there I mean not as mere simple entertainment, which I find, kind of find boring, but as an art form. I would just like to ask in relation to the war film, is Platoon the best film can do? Of course not. And this also amounts to modern warfare or Call of Duty or whatever. Um, so we need to create a space, um, both economic, cultural, but also discursive and economic, for good games to be made. If you want to make a triple-A title, you need a hell of a lot of money. And you can't risk that money by gambling on an entire war game no one will buy, right? So you have an economic incentive to reproduce the same old shit again and again. So we need public funding for good games, as we have public funding for good films. And they started that, I know that, but we need more. Uh, because then we can make games as, art, as an art form. Games that challenge us into seeing things we really do not want to see, and that do not let, leave us alone once we turn off the television, just like this war of mind does so effectively. And in the process, I think we can grow, both individually and as a society, and that in particular in relation to war. Thank you. Right, and we have a, yeah, but we would just a quick comment to the, I, I would call it content marketing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new word today, but obviously war games today, modern war, war games are, are content marketing. But, uh, uh, not only to, uh, I don't think specifically to push any policy, but uh, I think it's more basic than that. Uh, most armies in, in, I mean, United States, Britain, even now in Norway, are being more and more professional, and they need people <laughs> to join the army. And these are recruitment games. A lot of these games are, are actually, you know, join the army, see the world, <laughs> basic lines, and also for the weaponry shown in the the weapons industry is enormous uh, and obviously a lot of places like in the US, you know, 
pick your favorite gun from the game, you can go to the shop and buy it. You can even get a discount. So, come to Barclay.